Are you ready to meet the man who signed his paintings in his own blood? That's right, you can tell that your piece is a Thomas Kincaid original by doing a DNA test. My name is Isabel, I'm an artist, I like doing artsy things, and now I have an art channel. Thomas Kincaid. It's estimated that 1 in 20 American homes own a Thomas Kincaid painting. He's considered one of the most successful artists of our time, and yet he is the most controversial. Today, I will be telling the juicy details why. Have you seen these cute little cottages? These are some of the works by Thomas Kincaid. Thomas Kincaid was born January 19th of 1958. He attended University of California, Berkeley, as well as Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. This, the summer of 1980 was a pivotal time for Thomas Kincaid. Him and his best friend James Gurney road tripped across the United States and documented their travels with sketches. These sketches were published in a book, An Artist's Guide to Sketching, with Guptill Publications. Two years after, the book was released and was a bestseller for that year. This led to a job offer with Ralph Bakshil Studios for the feature film Fire and Ice, and it was this film that set the pace for the rest of Kincaid's career. During that project, he began to build his signature style of experimenting with his depiction of light and imaginary worlds. Kincaid's style is based upon idyllic cozy cottages, stunning landscapes, churches on top of hilltops, and Disney characters. He is most known for his use of light, which resembles luminism, a painting style that has an emphasis on a unique clarity of light. The use of light in his painting was a brand that Kincaid built for himself. To solidify this brand, he ever so humbly coined himself the name Painter of Light. Kincaid claimed that his art put an emphasis on the simple pleasures of life. His intent was to communicate inspirational messages through his paintings. According to the official Thomas Kincaid Studios website, through, though at the time he was an already an acclaimed illustrator, Tom found that he was inspired not by fame and fortune, but by the simple act of painting straight from the heart, putting on canvas the natural wonders and images that moved him the most. Tom's dear wish had always been that his art would be a messenger of hope and inspiration to others, a message to slow down, appreciate the little details in life, and to look for beauty in the world around us. Kincaid was also self-described as a devout Christian. Specifically, he went to the Church of Nazarene. In fact, he was so devout that he gave all his children the middle name Christian after his faith. The Church of Nazarene has two core beliefs that sets it apart from other evangelical churches. The first being the belief that a person can experience entire sanctification or personal holiness in their life. The second is the belief that a saved person can lose their salvation through sin. Just put a pin in that for now. Kincaid said he gained inspiration from his religious beliefs and that his work included a moral dimension. To me, this makes sense. The nature and light depicted in his work is reminiscent of the sublime art movement. Sublime art is art that refers to greatness beyond all calculation, measurement, or imitation. And this has deep ties to religious art by using the beauty of na nature to exemplify the omnipotence of God. According to the Thomas Kincaid Studios website, like all great artists who were not content to create in the status quo, Thomas Kincaid garnered controversy along with a critical acclaim. He used symbols and uplifting imagery to communicate his point of view and veered away from many of the popular postmodern styles of art that denigrate the human experience. By forging his own path and developing his own distinct styles and techniques, Thomas Kincaid has come to be recognized as a great American artist. Although technically talented, the success of Kincaid did not solely lie in his paintings. In fact, a lot of the credit goes to his marketing techniques. Kincaid made more money than any other artist in the 20th century. At the height of his career, it was estimated that Kincaid was making 50 million per week, with 350 franchise galleries selling his work. When it was hard for other artists to make a living, Kincaid was living like Larry. Today, artists are more privileged because of the exposure that the internet gives them. However, back in the day, for an artist to get exposure, they had to go through galleries. Galleries make a percentage off the pieces they sell, which means they will only sell art that they think art collectors will buy. When galleries refused Kincaid's work, he did something absolutely genius. He opened his own galleries. 
Kincaid got investors for his galleries, created art that would appeal to a general audience, and bada bean, bada boom, he made money. Galleries not only provide a way for an artist to sell their work, they also give them notoriety. If an artist can make it into a gallery, it's assumed that they are a good artist. Hundreds of galleries began popping up, with Thomas Kincaid in shining letters out front. These galleries did not just sell the art, they sold the whole Thomas Kincaid experience. According to the Guardian, they weren't just galleries, they were the Thomas Kincaid experience. Clients would be ushered into a climate-controlled viewing room to maximize the Kincaidness of the whole place in their experience. This experience was further garnered by master highlighters whose job was to add paint to a desired print. Basically, Kincaid had originals and prints available in his galleries. However, a master highlighter was available to add a custom splash of paint onto a print driving up its value and making it something wholly new and unique. Now, middle-class Americans can own a piece of original art, something that is seen as a luxury. And Thomas Kincaid did not stop at his paintings. To this day, you could go to Walmart and find a Thomas Kincaid calendar. He would purpose his art into different products, making multiple incomes off of a handful of pieces. No doubt this was another deliberate marketing strategy. According to this article in The Guardian, Kincaid said, There have been million seller books and million seller CDs, Kincaid explained, but there hasn't been, until now, a million seller art. The Thomas Kincaid Studios website garners a version of him that is seen as an artistic genius. A beautifully talented man whose paintings are laden with deeper meaning. However, critics have a very different take on Kincaid. In fact, many people describe Kincaid's work as bad art, and for a long time, I never understood why. Sure, I didn't want his pieces hanging up in my house, but when I studied the painting in detail, I didn't see anything wrong with them. They were incredibly detailed, and Kincaid obviously had a deep understanding of the relationships between light and color, something I personally struggle with. So why is it bad art? Many artists describe Kincaid's work as kitsch. Which, if you don't know what that means, it's a German word that is applied to art that is perceived as a naive imitation, overly eccentric, gratuitous, and banal of taste. In fact, Kincaid was coined the name King of Kitsch. Given his talent for marketing, critics accuse Kincaid of pandering to his audience, creating the same images over and over, splashing some paint here and there, and calling it fine art. It was hardly anything authentic. And I can see what they mean. For example, for this piece, Bambi's First Year, Kincaid said, I believe Bambi's First Year is the most breathtaking subject in my, Dis my Disney Dreams collection to date. I hope as you look at Bambi cresting on the ridge of his domain, you too will feel empowered to live your best life. And to count on the season of new beginnings, even when the challenges of life confront you. Truly for Bambi and for all of us, life goes on. It seems a little bit over the top for a simple cartoon about a baby deer, but go off, hun. And it was things like this that caused people to question Kincaid's authenticity and therefore his integrity as an artist. In order to know if a piece is authentic, we must know the artist's true intent behind the piece. There's no way to tell if Kincaid really believed if that Bambi's first year was about feeling empowered in your life. He claims this, but perhaps he's saying this to appease his audience. We know he's good at marketing, so how far does this marketing ploy go? The truth is, art is subjective. And because of this, the intended meaning behind a piece just isn't important. An artist may create a work with a message to convey, but that doesn't mean the audience will receive it in the same way, if at all. And art is supposed to be relatable. If we explicitly knew the meaning behind every single piece, doesn't that take away from its relatability? So I think the most important question we should be asking about Kincaid's work is, is it meaningful for other people? And the answer is yes. According to this article by NPR, Amy Davis, who teaches art at the University of California, Los Angeles, wrote her master's thesis on Kincaid. I've heard about almost quasi-religious experiences with some of these paintings, Davis says. When I look at a Thomas Kincaid painting, I get a warm, soft, cozy feeling, says window shopper Anna King. Like, I want to go into where that is and be a part of it. I think it harkens back to some imagined past, she says, before cities, before crowds, before traffic, 
before the stresses of everyday life. People want to find that cabin in the woods or that church on the hill. It's a call back to simpler times and happier days, free from the daunting responsibilities of adulthood. According to Kincaid himself, it's not the world we live in, it's the world we wish to live in. People wish they could find that stream, that cabin in the woods. The peace and serenity that, that people get from Kincaid's painting show that they do indeed have a profound impact. So maybe I have convinced you that Kincaid's authenticity doesn't really matter, but doesn't that still make him a sellout? Well, yes, but I'm going to counter that by saying everyone has to sell out by some degree, especially artists. The reality of it is that we all have to make money to live. And let's face it, no one's being rewarded just by being artistically talented. Whether you work for a studio, freelance, or self-employed, there are times you're going to have to take jobs or projects that you are not passionate about. You may have to do a commission you don't want to do, look at analytics to make content that your audience will better receive, or completely change your art style to get a job at a studio. Selling out is unavoidable in an economy that's ran by optimized productivity. We must produce something that has value outside of ourselves in order to make an income. And unfortunately, with like how common burnout is amongst creative people, it's really impossible to feel inspired and motivated and therefore authentic all the time. I'm, and I'm not the first one to say these in defense of Kincaid, but the points that his critics bring against him bring up some very bring up some very philosophical questions about the nature of art. Is there such thing as good or bad art? What is authenticity? And is it morally wrong to be inauthentic in order to make money? These questions don't have cut and dry answers, and in fact there are philosophers who dedicate their lives to answering them. So what's the point of criticizing Kincaid? For a long time I came to the conclusion that people were only jealous of Thomas Kincaid, and I just left it at that. However, however, when doing research for this video, I realized that this was, this was only the tip of the iceberg for the controversy surrounding Kincaid. Now, for the real tea. What was Thomas Kincaid like as a person? Turns out, not very pleasant. His transgressions include a long history of cursing and heckling other artists and performers, an account of him fondling a woman's breasts at a South Bend, Indiana sales event. There was this one occasion where Kincaid became drunk at a Siegfried and Roy magic show. He began, I guess he began yelling codpiece at the performers, supposedly because one of them was wearing a codpiece. If you don't know what a cod piece is, it's a it's an art it's like a piece of cloth or clothing to cover a man's well. You get the idea. My personal favorite story has to do with a little something that Kincaid called ritual territory marking. Most notably when he peed on a Winnie the Pooh statue in Disneyland while yelling, This one's for you, Walt. I mean, honestly, that's that's funny to me, but also like what did Winnie the Pooh ever do to you? I, I find it interesting because apparently these paintings that he made of these Disney characters were just so deep and meaningful. You would think he would have some kind of reverence for the characters in the park and just Disney in general. Kincaid was also an alcoholic and that just seemed to fuel a lot of these problems that he had with the public. In June of 2010, Kincaid was arrested for driving under the influence in Carmel, California. Now, for the biggest tea of all, so remember how Kincaid got investors for all those galleries he opened? Well, in 2003, two of those investors, Karen Hazelwood and Jeffrey Spinella, sued Kincaid for failing to disclose material information that would have dissuaded them from investing in the gallery. The plaintiffs, as well as other former gallery owners, accused Kincaid of pressuring them to open galleries. This is like the hardest part. I 
I got this. The plaintiffs, as well as other former gallery owners, accused Kincaid of pressuring them to open additional galleries that were not financially feasible. They were also forced to accept unsalable inventory and were being undersold by discount outlets with prices they were not allowed to compete with. Essentially, Kincaid was scamming them by taking their money to build these galleries, but then gave them merchandise they couldn't sell, competing with competitors with prices they couldn't beat. Meanwhile, Kincaid's still making money, and if that isn't bad enough, Kincaid presented these galleries as some sort of religious opportunity, using faith manipulation to get his investors to buy. And although he was not singled out in the panel's fraud finding, it was, not it was noted that many members of the company perpetuated a certain religious environment that was purposely designed to get prospective gallery owners to trust the company. Hazelwood and Spinella were not the only people to be hurt by Thomas Kincaid. They were merely the face of this lawsuit. In actuality, I think there was dozens if not hundreds of people who were scammed by Kincaid. Hazelwood and Spinella were awarded $860,000 in damages and $2.8 million in fees and expenses. This prompted an appeal from Kincaid and his legal team which set off a whole nother legal battle that went all the way to the US Supreme Court. And it, at the end of it, the court said, too bad, so sad, Kincaid, you gotta pay up. And they set a date for $1 million to be paid to the plaintiffs. However, on June 2nd of 2010, Pacific Metro, which is the production company that Kincaid founded, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. If you don't know what that means, Chapter 11 bankruptcy allows a business to continue operating with restricted debt and lower payments. There is something called an automatic stay, which prevents foreclosures and ongoing debt collection. Editing Isabel here. My camera chose a really unfortunate point to turn off as I was explaining this, um, but basically the automatic stay protects debtors from bank levies, foreclosures, repossessions, wage garnishments, and most conveniently for Kincaid, lawsuits. So at the end of it all, Kincaid got to keep the money that was earned off the backs of the people he scammed and he was protected from the lawsuit with his bankruptcy. And after learning these details, my thoughts on Kincaid have changed to say in the least, before I wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. And I believed for a long time that people just didn't like him because they were jealous. I still don't believe he's culpable for being inauthentic in a sellout, but given what we know about his personality and the outcome of this lawsuit, I think we can make a pretty educated guess about what Thomas Kincaid actually cared about. I mean, he really put on this act of being a devout Christian, and yet Kincaid used that to manipulate potential investors. Which is interesting because one of the core beliefs of the Nazarene Church is that you can lose your salvation through sin. So it doesn't seem like he really adheres to the values he says he does, including making work that is laden with deeper meaning. Thomas Kincaid passed away April 6th of 2012 of an acute intoxication from alcohol and diazepam also known as Valium. In case you didn't know, Valium is a drug that is used to treat anxiety, seizures, muscle spasms, and twitches, but it's also known to alleviate withdrawal from alcohol. Kincaid never came back from the bad publicity of this lawsuit, and trust me, it was all over the news. Uh, and as a result of it, more than half of his 350 galleries closed. But I find it sad because um, knowing that he was prescribed Valium, we can assume that he was trying to get better. Um, anyway, he was trying to get better, uh, but sadly he passed away before he got the chance to redeem himself. His estate was inherited by his girlfriend and there is this huge beef with him and his ex-wife because, because he left behind a handwritten will, which could have been forged but eventually they reach a settlement of an undisclosed amount. Kincaid's company still exists to this day, selling paintings where apprentices trained in the Kincaidian style sell them as Thomas Kincaid originals. And to this day, a handful of galleries still remain open. According to The Guardian, for a while Kincaid's work is at best humdrum and technically adequate, its popularity tells us about his public about a desperate yearning for nostalgia that pervades parts of American life, 
A return to the safe glow of some imagined past. Maybe the only authentic thing about Kincaid's work was the nostalgia for simpler times. I can picture Kincaid as a bright-eyed youth traveling the country with his best friend, energized by doing the thing that he loved, yearning as many of us young creatives do to make it big. And perhaps it was his first taste of real success that made it all go to his head, causing him to spiral into addiction, greed, and a heap of legal trouble. This is all speculation, of course. But it isn't hard for me to believe that Kincaid hoped for simpler times, simpler ways, nostalgia for when life wasn't so complicated. And perhaps that is the only truly authentic thing about Kincaid's paintings. And that, my friends, is Thomas Kincaid, painter of light, King of Kitsch, Mother of Dragons. Bye!